Hello and welcome back to another episode on how to buy a house in the 21st century. If you have not watched the other parts of this series, go back and check them out. But today we are going to be talking about how to get prepared to purchase a home. This is going to be the hardest part of everything we're talking about. The entire series on how to buy a house in the 21st century. The hardest part is this step which is getting prepared to buy one and especially around getting enough money in your bank account to be able to purchase one. So excited to jump in today and kind of talk to you about this process, how I was able to purchase my first home, which is hands down the hardest one to buy. Everyone after that was infinitely easier and every house you buy after the first one gets easier and easier and easier. So you just really, really, really want to figure out how to get your hands on that first property because I promise you, Every single one after that will be significantly, significantly easier. Uh, Once again, my name is Chris. I am a normal person that just happened to get into real estate investing. I am not special, smart, anything like that. I grew up in a middle-class family. I went to college because I was told that's what you're supposed to do. Graduated college with student loan debt and uh, yeah, was just graduated, went to normal nine to five, would drive to work 45 minutes worth of traffic, sit at a cubicle, watch the sunrise, watch the sunset, get back in my car, sit in traffic bumper to bumper, get home, was gaining weight like none other because you're not moving all day. I went from, you know, being a freaking five sport letterman in high school, running in college, playing every intramural sport you could imagine, and then got into the real world and just would sit in traffic and then sit at a desk and then go to sleep every single day. And it was miserable. And so I thought, this cannot be, this cannot be what the next 50 years of my life will entail. This is, is this is the worst, <laughs> like, this is the worst. So I formulated a game plan to get out of the rat race with uh, my wife as well. So we started this like real estate journey back in probably 2019, 2020. I mean, I'd always been very interested in real estate. I'd always kind of dabbled in it, but uh, never actually gone full in and actually started investing and purchasing my own home. So started that journey back in 2020, I guess was when I purchased the first home, 2019, 2020. I don't know. I should probably know these dates. My wife is good with all the the bookkeeping and dates and all that fun stuff, but uh, purchased it about five years ago. Purchased the first one. Fast forward to today, we now own six properties, 12 units, uh, all cash flowing other than our primary residence, which we live in. It's our dream home. We got hot tub, basketball court, gym in the basement, uh, enough bedrooms so that we can both have our own office because we both, both work remote and from home. So yeah, it can be done. However, it is a grind. I will not lie. We went from, at least I specifically, went from being in student loan debt, a bunch of bad debt, car debt, credit card debt, uh, kind of credit card debt, but you know, car debt, credit card debt, student loan debt, all this crap. And then five years later, uh, all bad debt completely paid off. And uh, now my wife and I are multimillionaires and we did all that before the age of 30. So I know that if I can do it, somebody that <laughs> was, when, uh, if anybody out there knows what like resources is, that's where like the kids that either don't speak English or are really bad at reading are in. That's what I was in in high school. So if I, if I <laughs> can do it, anyone can do it. So with that said, let's jump into this week's episode on getting prepared to purchase a home. Once again, this is the hardest part of the whole process. So first step in getting prepared to buy a home, I'm just going to go step by step. You need to have either a good paying job or have built a successful business that has been profitable for the last two years and profitable meaning like you can pay yourself a legit W2 from that job. This is the hardest part, all right? So if you are running a business and you're not able to pay yourself, you're not able to pay yourself a large amount of money, uh, or if you have a job but it's not very high paying, I would highly recommend quitting that job and getting a different job that is higher paying. There's a bunch of studies. If you want to watch, there's a video that Graham Stephan, who's just like kind of like a financial guru guy online, uh, he talks about how important it is to be switching jobs every few years because it'll allow you to get a higher base, higher base, higher base um, every time you switch, which is annoying that if you stay at a job, you don't get that benefit of getting uh, higher pay, but it's just true. So you should be switching. Also something that I would highly, highly recommend if you have the flexibility is to get a fully remote job. This is good for two reasons. One, which we'll talk about in later episodes when it comes to like finding your home. But if you have a fully remote job, it will allow you much more flexibility on where you can purchase that home because you don't have to be stuck in like the area you're in, especially if you're in like a high 
like a high uh, cost of living area like D.C., New York, or, you know, basically all of California, it will allow you to get out into the suburbs, into the sticks, and be able to purchase that first home, which also will typically mean you'll be able to cash flow more. So that's one benefit of having a remote job. The second benefit of having a remote job is something called overemployment, where you can get multiple fully remote jobs. Uh, it is not illegal. It might be against the terms of service with your employer, so you might get fired. But, hey, if you want to do it, I will put a link to a video down below. Talking about overemployment, it is something that uh, I have dabbled in, and uh, I would highly recommend it if you're trying to stack up cash quick. It is a very, very, very good way to do it. Um, so, with that said, you got to figure out how to make that money, and you got to figure out how to put it into the bank account. And then the second part off of that is after you start making good money, you need to be as frugal as humanly possible, okay? Because at the end of the day, you need to be putting money into your savings account or into really like a really safe index fund like spy um, because you you need to be stacking up cash you can't start making more money and then spending all of the money you know the second you start making more money and you're like yeah no, i know i really want to buy this house but like look like i'm grinding i'm working two jobs yada yada let's just let's just get a house with a second a second bedroom so i can have my home apartment and, and while i'm at it let me get a nicer desk and let me get a second monitor no you need to keep all of your living expenses the way that you're living right now either cut down on them or or yeah, I mean, just cut down on them ideally. Like, literally, try and spend as, like, as little money as possible. But uh, if you can't cut down on them, don't increase your living. It's called lifestyle creep, where you just make more money and you start to increase your lifestyle. Uh, obviously, we all want to do that, but we have to be able to do that once we are in a position to be able to afford that lifestyle creep. All right. I, up until a few, literally a few months ago, my wife and I were living in both working remote. We were living in a one bed, one bath, barely a kitchen unit in one of our properties for the two of us with our cat it was very tight quarters both working remote you can only imagine me screaming on all my sales calls it was very miserable for both of us but look that was that was the game we were playing and so it took us once again it took us five years of grinding living in tiny little units uh saving every penny we could to get to where we are today so i'm not saying it's gonna be easy but it's something you're gonna have to do so make more money and then be extremely frugal with the money that you do earn all right once you have that part checked off the next step is going to be paying off bad debts. So what is the difference between good debt and bad debt? Good debt is debt that you acquire to then ideally make more money from the money that you're being lent, all right? Or make more money at a faster rate than the interest rate that you're getting. So good debt, really the most typical two good debts would be if you're getting a loan to start a business, that is risky though, because you get that loan and then you need to make sure that you are making money from your business at a faster rate than the interest rate that you're paying uh, or at a better rate of return than the interest rate that you're getting. Another good debt, good debt air quotes, is your home because ideally you're making more money at a faster rate than the mortgage that you have on that property. All right. So that would be considered good debt. Good debt is any debt that you can borrow, any money that you can borrow and then make money back from it at a faster rate of return than your interest rate. All right. Then on the flip side, bad debt is basically every other debt that you can ever acquire. Bad debt is not, you never want bad debt ever, ever, ever. Like, honestly, that is what just, just kills all of America, especially like the middle and lower class is debt. All right. So bad debts that you're going to want to make sure that you're paying off as quick as possible. Car loans. All right. Second, student loans. Third, credit card debt. I mean, credit card debt is brutal, brutal, brutal debt. You want to make sure you're paying that off. Medical bills. Any debt, any debt that you have out there, God forbid you have like debt on furniture or something. Pay all of it off as fast as possible because that is going to be the next most important thing. All right. So get that good job, then be frugal, and then start paying down all of your bad debt. Once you have all of your bad debt paid away, the next thing, which will just naturally happen if you do those first few steps, is you're going to want to get your credit score to at least 700. You only need a credit score of about 650 to get pre-approved for a mortgage. However, your credit score is what's going to dictate your uh, interest rate. So if you want to get as good of a rate as possible and have as low of a monthly payment as possible, you're, wanting, you're going to want to get your credit score as high as possible. Your credit score is really just dictated off of how much money that you're able to borrow. So it would be, uh, what do they call that? They call that your credit limit. So if you have a bunch of credit cards, they all have limits on them of what you're allowed to spend. So say you have like five credit cards, all have a $10,000 spending limit. That means you have a credit limit of 5,000. All right. So you're going to want to then spend as little of that credit limit as possible because to the banks, they're going to go, wow, we're giving this dude, or we're giving this girl the ability to spend $50,000 a month. And they're only spending a hundred bucks a month. Wow. This is great. They're so responsible and they will increase your credit score, all right? 
So, I mean, it's really that simple. Have a large credit limit and spend as little of it as possible. That will really increase your credit very quickly. Also, you want to have as little debt as possible. So if you spent all your time paying off those bad debts, naturally your credit score is going to go up. If you want more resources on how to get the basically the highest credit score possible and rebuild your credit as quick as possible. I'll link to one of Graham Stephan's videos uh, below and you can check it out. It goes into a lot of detail about how to do it. But end of the day, it's basically just make money, be frugal, pay off your debt. All right. And then keep your credit limit very low um, or credit utilization is what it's called. But anyways, next, after all those things are done, this is where honestly, out of all of those things, you would think like paying off the debt is going to be hard. Getting the high paying job is going to be hard. Being frugal is going to be hard and being frugal is going to be hard. But the most important or maybe not most important, but the hardest part is going to be actually saving your money for that down payment. Because so many people, once again, going back to lifestyle creep, start to make some money, start to spend some money. They don't budget right. And they just, they just, for whatever reason, just always seem to have a very hard time keeping that money in a bank account. So what I would recommend when it comes to saving up for that down payment is if you have a W-2 job or even if you have your own job uh, or you're, you own your own business, I would recommend setting up a separate bank account. All right. That like a separate bank account with a totally separate bank. So say just hypothetically you bank with Wells Fargo, I would recommend setting up a Chase Bank or Bank of America. You pick the random bank you want and I would set up a checking or a savings account with them. And ideally I use Chase because they have a really high, um, like uh, dividend payout every single month. So go with Chase or some other bank that pays out a high dividend um, for you. But I would recommend that you set up a completely separate bank account that you don't even download the app onto your phone. Just have your payroll automatically deposit into that bank account whatever percentage, the high, the highest percentage you can, and you don't even touch it. This is not emergency funds. This is this is exclusively for buying your house. You pretend like that money is burnt. Pretend like it's taxes. Pretend like it's the government stealing, legally stealing your money and putting it away forever, okay? So you download, you set up this bank account with a random bank that you don't bank with right now and set it up, have part of your payroll go into it, and you literally never look at that account ever, 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 ever until you're ready to buy your house, okay? Because the second you open it up, and I know from personal experience, is you'll open it up and you go, yo, what the freak? How do I have $20,000 sitting in a bank account? I've never had $20,000 in my life. Oh, let's go. Honey, you want to go on vacation? No, you literally cannot look at it because the second you start to see big numbers in that account that you're not used to seeing, you will just naturally start to spend the money. So you cannot, cannot, cannot do that. So set it up, save it. Ideally, if you're trying to do it perfectly, I would recommend having half of that money sitting in cash, Half of that money, not financial advice, but for me personally, I can say half of my money sits in a savings account. Half of the money just sits in the S&P 500, okay? So that's what I would do, and you just never touch it, okay? Until you have, ideally, at a bare bones minimum of 10% of the purchase price of the house that you're looking to purchase, all right? And for your first house, I would be looking at a house in the price range of 250000 to 400000 Obviously, you can go lower. Obviously, you can go higher, but that would be like a good price point to be looking at in this economy with these rates. I'm recording this, obviously, at the end of 2024. I would recommend looking in that price point. Now, I know what you're thinking. You might be saying, well, Chris, where I live, there are no houses for less than 600000 And I believe you. Trust me, I was living in Northern Virginia, and there is nothing, nothing you can buy for less than probably half a million. And that is like you're buying like a condo. Um, and I'll talk about looking at houses later. I would not recommend buying any condos or buying any townhouses or anything like that that are in an HOA community um, just because a lot of different factors we'll talk about later. But regardless, you in Northern Virginia cannot buy anything for less than half a million dollars, like anything. You, you couldn't even buy a trailer, like a shack um, for less than half a million dollars in Northern Virginia. Well, unfortunately, you have one of two options. Or actually, really one of three options if you're telling me you can't find anything in that price point. Option one is, and this is most likely the issue, it's probably not that you're living in a high like high cost of living area. Uh, this is might be a thing for people that are in like Northern Virginia, D.C. area, New York, or like L.A. But for the rest of you, this is probably not an issue. Probably the issue is you need to lower your standards, unfortunately. You are probably renting or living with your parents or renting or whatever the case is in a nicer place than the first house you're going to be able to purchase or afford. Okay. So lower your standards. That's going to be the first option uh, or first thing to fix this problem. Second thing, let's say that you are actually living in an area where the cost of living is significantly higher than the price point that I just gave you. Well, ideally you are getting that remote job so that you have the flexibility to move into the suburbs or move out of the expensive cost of living area. This is going to be good for multiple reasons. First off, because you're going to get a bigger bang for your buck. Also, typically in those areas that are a little bit more rural, uh, you also get a better um, 
basically a cat the proper cash flow better get a better rate of return and then if if you can't lower you refuse to lower your standards or maybe that's not an option you can't move out because you got a really good job and you got to be close to the city unfortunately option c is that you're going to have to start saving up more money and once again you're going to want to have about 10 percent of the down payment and I will say this is going to be the hardest thing because you're basically competing against your own lovely government here in the United States because they print so much money that the inflation is going to be basically competing against the U.S. government to save money faster than they print it. Because for every – think about like you probably hear people all the time like, oh, my God, if I would have bought a house in the back it Well, yeah, the problem is that since we're printing so much money here in America and interest or inflation just keeps going up and up and up, you are literally competing against your own government when it comes to saving money quick enough to be able to purchase a house. So – in that scenario, you're just going to have to be even more frugal, maybe get a third job if you're going to be overemployed, and you're just going to have to save as much as quick as possible. All right. So now that we've done all that, so just to repeat, you're going to want to get a good paying job uh, or maybe multiple jobs. Uh, you are going to want to be very, 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 very frugal. You're going to want to pay off all your bad debts. You're going to want to get a credit score over 700. You're going to want to be putting away money so that you can purchase this home, ideally 10%. Uh, you won't end up using all 10% to buy the house, but you're going to want to have that extra money for renovations and repairs. Once you've done all those things, the last thing is to be get pre-approved for a mortgage. All right. And that is what next week's episode will be all about. It will be talking about what it means to even get pre-approved, who you should be working with to get pre-approved. Uh, we'll be going into everything when it comes to just getting that loan. So Tune in next week's for uh, t next week's episode so that I can go over all of that with you. Probably the the understanding and knowing how to use other people's money, aka lending, is the way that every real estate investor makes their money. That that is where you make all your money when it comes to real estate. You don't really make that much money from renting out the property. You don't really make that much money from the, you know, whatever the cash flow or from the resale. I mean, you can with all these things, obviously, but the way that you make the majority of your money when it comes to real estate investing is the lending and understanding the lending. So that is this week's episode on how to buy a property in the 21st century. If you appreciate me giving you all this knowledge for free, I'm not trying to sell you some coaching course. I'm not trying to get you to you know call me up and do consulting calls. I'm literally just doing this because I've already made my money. I don't need to make any more money. So, well, I always want to make more money. I'm just, but you know what I'm saying? I'm not here to like take anyone's money in my subscribers money. None of that crap. I'm literally just doing this because I'm trying to educate people. Uh, I have so many friends and family members and colleagues that are always curious on how I'm doing everything I'm doing in the real estate space. And so I figured I will just vomit dump all of my information into this series because I think there is a lot of good information online, but a lot of it's outdated at this point. So trying to make a good series explaining how you make money in the 21st century in real estate, uh, explaining how I did it. And so if you appreciate me doing this all that i ask all that i ask is that you subscribe to my youtube channel and like this video if you have questions on anything i talked about in this episode if you want me to go into more detail about anything just comment on this video what you want me to answer in more depth and i'd be more than happy to do so in an upcoming episode and with that said peace out y'all